Um, so my name's Steph. I work for the RSPB on pesticide policy. Um, and this webinar is uh, one of five, um, a series that we've been running on pesticides or rather how to reduce pesticides via integrated pest management or IPM. Um, some of the other webinars um, included topics such as um, how fungi can support your IPM strategy um, and cover crops in IPM and beneficial um, predatory insects in IPM. Um, and this one is a, a sort of broader one um, covering a, a number of different techniques, but with the focus on field horticulture specifically. Um, all the talks have been recorded um, and you can access them from the Agricology website and I'll post a link in the chat so that you can see those and this one will be added to that too. Um, and alongside the webinars, we've also produced um, five case studies working with some farmers who are particularly strong on their IPM uh, techniques. Um, and we'll also be putting those webinar, uh, sorry, those case studies um, on the Agricology website too. So keep your eyes peeled for those. So I will let each speaker introduce themselves properly um, when they give their presentation. But just as a quick overview of the session, um, to start with, we're going to hear from Carolyn Cox. Um, Carolyn is Managing Director of the Green Grow Consultancy, Horticultural Advisor at the Soil Association and Experienced Grow and Agronomist. Um, and then we're going to hear from Peter Rapson and Dominic Walsh, who are farm managers at a community farm in Cambridge. Um, also on the call is Gavin Shelton, who's the founder of the uh, co-farm in Cambridge. So any specific questions on, on that side of things, um, hopefully he'll be able to help too. So the idea of the session um, is to provide some technical examples of IPM in horticulture, both large scale and small scale. Um, as I said, once we've heard the presentations, we'll open the floor for questions, um, but a reminder to please post questions in the chat as we go, and we'll come to them at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Carolyn. Uh, we can't hear you, Carolyn, if you're talking. Oh, oh. can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, yeah. brilliant. And you can see the presentation. Yes, Excellent. we can. Thank you. Yeah. So we're off to a great start. Great. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for making the time to join us this evening. I'd also just like to thank the sponsors for the session as well and for Steph for inviting us. So it's um, a collaborative um effort tonight with the Soil Association, PAN, CoFarm, RSPB and uh, the Nature Friendly Farming Network. So um, as Steph briefly said, I'm um, a horticultural advisor with the Soil Association charity, so um, advising and supporting uh, growers, members and licensees on anything horticultural and I work closely with the Innovative Farming Network as well on um, current and new um, horticulturally focused um, field labs, which I'll touch on very briefly. Um, so I think I've got around about 20 minutes, so I'll just um, fly through this. So my uh, the focus of the presentation tonight is predominantly on um, IPM strategies in field veg on a commercial scale. So uh, we're just going to follow the um, a very brief agenda. We'll cover the basics of an of an integrated pest management principles. Uh, we're going to look at prevention methods, decision and support, physical controls, biological controls, chemical controls, and the trials and tribulations of trying to implement an IPM strategy. So the basic principles of IPM are really the we focus it's a basic pyramid I'm sure we've all seen it a hundred times but it's a great um, it's a great reminder um, so first of all we're looking at prevention so methods of prevention um, such things like rotation varietal selection is there a potential to be intercropping and then we're going to look at decision support whether that be through monitoring or forecasting pest and disease pressures what physical controls are available to us? So things like mechanical cultivations or putting in physical barriers. And then we've got biological controls. So biological products such as um, the insect, the biological insecticide flipper, which I'm sure um, a few of you will be quite familiar with, or the and things such as the introduction of beneficial insects as well. And then lastly, um, our sort of our last line of defence within the um, IPM strategy 
is chemicals, so a chemical control within plant, as in plant protection products. So if we look at the prevention techniques, so things that we can consider um, when we're looking at prevention of um, pests and disease, we can look at rotation. So have we got a varied rotation within um, our growing area that we're managing? Are we looking at different crops with different rooting depths? Um, are, we, are we able to alleviate compaction? with these different crops, are we increasing soil biology activity as well? And what effect does that have on pest and disease? Are we able to increase soil organic matter and nutrient levels by varying our rotation? And are we able to um, implement parts of the rotation that have naturally occurring pest and disease control? So one of the things particularly that I'm looking at at the moment is we're just um, we're setting up a field lab through the Innovative Farmers Network on the use of biofumigant and cover crops in the control of um, wireworm in, in following potato crops. So can we put green covers of specific species and varieties prior to a, prior to a horticultural crop that's gonna have an effect on a, on a target pest and disease? And then we can look at also, can we integrate livestock within those rotations as well to increase nutrient levels and also um, to do some of the, um, yeah, to increase nutrient levels and to add some more diversity in, into the rotation. But also with that, we need to be conscious with nutrient lockup as well. So if we're increasing um, soil nutrients, we may see some nutrient lockup within um, Within the, within the crops as well. So that's also something to bear in mind. And then we look at varietal selection. So on the horticult horticultural crops that we, we're looking to grow, we've, we, select, we try and look at selecting crops that have got pest and disease resistance. So are, the, are there varieties out there that have better disease resistance? A particular focus of mine was in, is in the brassica sector. So we're always looking for varieties that have better um, ring spot resistance, mildew resistance. And also we look at the physical plant architecture as well. So that's a pit on the uh, right hand side, there's a picture of some of a cauliflower. So where we, we, we're particularly within the cauliflowers are looking for something with a well wrapped leaf. So the, the leaves are coming right up over the curd. And by doing that, they're, they're protecting the curd against things like bleaching from the sun, but also an attack from aphids or aphids getting into the curd itself. It's a little bit more expensive to harvest because our harvesting teams are having to go out and look for the curd. It's taking them that little bit longer and they're not so exposed. But um, it does see it, it produces, much, we, we see huge benefits in quality. Um, and obviously the reduced need for um, further action to prevent uh, pest control. And then within um, a preventative measure, we can also look at intercropping. So can we companion plant or can we intercrop with species such as clover? There's a picture of some uh, clover or um, established an understory within a vegetable crop that's going to be a host for beneficial insects. It's going to increase the nutrient holding capacity of the soil and increase soil diversity. So that's something to consider as well. And again, we're just, um, we're looking at developing a project within the Soil Association and with partners in Europe in intercropping within the horticultural sector as well. And then we can look at decision support. So by decision support, we can do, um, individual field inspections and within those inspections we can look at we can decide what 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 is our tolerance level for pest and disease and that will change depending on the year it is what our customer base is and what crops we're looking at there's a cabbage leaf there that you can see just at the top um, and that's got a really high level of winged aphid so that that pest that pest pressure there you can see is way above threshold it's particularly and we say it's particularly um, way above threshold as well because it's quite a young plant so we're going to see significant effects on that plant development with a high level of pest pressure like that and then on disease pressure we can we can decide when depending on um, the plant growth stage we decide what level of tolerance of, is 
what, what level of tolerance do we have for disease as well? Um, and that will, again, it'll depend on weather conditions, see, um, season, plant, plant growth stage, and um, our end customer as well. And we, it all it comes back to the same point. Do we perceive there's going to be a yield penalty if we don't take action now? And then we determine this by doing regular field walks. So through the season on, a, on horticultural crops, particularly things can change very, very quickly, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware. So we'll be doing these at least once a week, if not twice or three times. And then we look at forecasting. There's some really good forecasting tools out there. The screenshot I've got um, there is with them um, is the Rothamsted aphid forecast so um, there's a couple of links and things at the back of the presentation which you can see um, later on and we just think what what do we think is going to happen so what using these forecasting tools what do we think is going to happen what do we think the severity is that's going to come in the next weeks two weeks and um, and what experience can we gather what, what experience have we had previously and what, what information can we gather from that? So these forecasting tools are really helpful in formulating a decision. And then we've got monitoring as well. So we've got on-farm monitoring, all different types of um, monitoring that we can do, water traps, um, pheromone traps, which are, there's um, one in the top. Uh, right there. I've got an aphid sticky trap here as well, which we can put out. Um, and then there's um, tissue analysis is, all, is also a really good one um, when we're looking at on-farm monitoring because we want to ensure that plants are really healthy, they've got the correct amount of nutrients, and we've got a good balance of nutrients because we know that a healthy crop is going to be um, in much better condition to be able to ward off any pest or disease um, attacks. Uh, the, other trap, the other potential trapping technique that we can use is a pitfall trap. Pitfall traps are really useful to um, distinguishing soil invertebrates particularly and ground beetles um, for what, what's our level of predatory, um, pre what, what level of predatory insects have we got? Um, and these are just uh, the in the middle, that photo in the middle there was just taken from a basic pitfall trap, which was set into alcohol. So it's just a plastic cup sunk into the ground with a mesh over the top to stop any small mammals falling in. And um, I think it was probably left for about a week or 10 days. And then we can have a good look at what um, we can have a bit of a stab at identifying what species we've got. Um, but we can also send them away for independent analysis if that's um, if you think that might be useful. But what you can do that's really really useful with pitfall traps is you can you can set them um, across various parts of the field. So you could set them in some of your field margins and then into the crop and then a little bit further into the crop, and that gives us a really good idea of how what the spread is of beneficial insects from the field margin into the crop. And if you've got a large field, there may be, an off there may be a requirement to put um, a beetle bank or a field margin up through the middle or part way across, just to ensure that we've got enough habitat to um, ensure we've got good spread of beneficial insects throughout the crop. And then there's, um, an then there's access to wider networks as well. So wider networks of monitoring. So there's things like the War uh, Rothamsted and Warwick Crop Center have got some really good um, monitoring networks. Again, with the, some um, links in the back to those. There's um, the um, Syngenta Pest and Disease Forecasting, which is Syngenta have funded the AHDB in that um, for many years now. And I think that funding is going to continue, which is great news for the ind for industry. Um, so they're well worth looking at. And then there's remote traps as well. So there's um, Trap View, which is a company, again, the link is in the bottom of the, um, in the back of the presentation, which is a remote, sent it's a remote access pheromone trap. So that's in the top right there. So it's a basic pheromone trap. It's got a solar panel, a camera on the top, so you can set them across your growing area and then you can monitor them remotely. So I think they send photos every 24 hours or every 12 hours and you can build up a really good picture 
Um, you can also gain potentially gain access to other growers' data as well with their permission. So you look, you can look at um, pest migration over a much wider area. So again, that aids your um, predictions and and forecasting models. And then we've got physical controls as well. So cultural controls, whether that be um, natural predation and overwinter kill. So if we've had a good cold winter, like you can see on the on the uh, on the right there, um, we're going to get a good overwinter kill. I think that picture I took that in 2019. So that was in March 2019 in. Um, it's at Beast of the East, so 1819, I can't remember which one it was. So we knew that that year, going into the following season, we were going to get a really good overwinter kill. So it was likely that our pest pressure would be much lower for much longer at the start of the growing season. Obviously, subsequent years, we haven't necessarily seen that. Um, last year was a really good example. We, um, we had some good frosts in May. Um, up where where I'm based in North Lincolnshire, but then we got some um, but that didn't we didn't really see um, significant overwintered kill, and then um, we've got um, cultural control, so weed control, so basically removing any plants, um, anything but the target plant within the crop that's um, going to be a host for any pest and disease. So that's um, just a picture of a method of um, rotating weeds in at quite an early growth stage. And then there's the removal of any green bridges on the farm as well. So particularly where you're integrating um, green covers into your rotation, it's always worth bearing in mind, um, ensuring that you're, uh, removing the, you're removing those crop covers and leaving, in some cases, leaving time for a bit of natural predation from birds and various other different things um, to ensure there's no there's limited carryover into the following crop. And then we've got physical barriers as well, such as crop covers. So we've got um, on the left hand side there, there's some open cauliflower. And then next to that, there's some um, there's some cauliflower that's covered in net, which you can just see in the top of the photo. So that's a um, that gauge of net is really targeted at aphids. So it's quite a narrow gauge. But when you're selecting crop covers, it's really good to think about what what um, what pests am I wanting to deter or what pests am I wanting to prevent? Because if it's done something like birds on spring greens, then you can go for a much wider um, gauge which tend, tends to be considerably cheaper, or if you're looking at protecting against Swede midge or carrot fly, that, that would need a much narrower gauge, can be significantly more expensive. They are reusable, and we do see some really good benefits from using those sorts of crop covers. Um, just bear in mind with brassicas, they can get really hot. Under those nets can get really hot. So just if you're looking at a flowering crop, um, it's really good just to keep an eye on that heat and that particularly once the plants initiate, the growth points initiated as well, because um, that increase in heat could cause significant issues with quality and growth. And then um, on the right hand side there, that's just some broccoli, picture of some broccoli that I took um, last week and that's covered in fleece. So we tend to use fleece as a um, early, um, in the early season, just to ensure we've got more of a consistent growing, warmer growing temperature to bring the crop on a bit. But we do see significant benefits in it protecting against um, um, aphids, carrot, uh, cabbage root fly, and various different things. Um, and then I've spoken to some growers and they've actually made the choice to move outdoor production into protected cropping. Um, into a protected cropping scenario. So there's some, some growers that have done that on a smaller scale if they've got the availability of polytunnels um, particularly. And if we look at biological controls, so we've got an increase in biological products available such as flipper. Um, so uh, the product flipper is wi widely used in um, brass organic brassica production now. Um, it's we're seeing, an in, as far as sort of product legislation goes, we're seeing increased in stewardship of the use of these products. So that's things like timing. So 
on uh, with Flipper, for example, we've got the 1st of March to the 30th of August. That's the only time we can use the product, um, which covers the main pest season. But if we're getting um, if if we're getting a later a later infestation of um, of aphids, for example, that that cut off of the 30th of August can cause us a bit of, um, a bit of problems. We need to get really good coverage with these products, which tends to mean that we're putting them on at quite a high water rate, which can take quite a lot of them. Um, which can increase the time that we're spending on, on applying them and can be quite expensive. And it's really important that the application of these of, of a lot of these products is done at first sighting, which so they've got very limited knock, well, they've got no knockdown um, capabilities, unlike some of the chemical plant protection products have had in the past. So as soon as we see those pests appearing is when we should really start thinking about the first application. So that monitor that crop that takes us back to the crop monitoring. And if we're monitoring the crop on a regular basis, we should know when we've got the first sign of um, first signs of pressure. And these products are really centered around a life cycle disruptor. So as I say, there's no um, there's no quick knockdown activity in a lot of these new products that are coming through. And then another form of uh, beneficial um, biological control is the introduction of beneficial insects. So whether you're doing that on a more natural basis, and a really good idea is to establish what your baseline populations are. So whether that be um, setting, as I say, setting pit, pitfall traps, um, going just going up and down your field margins, you can pick these sweet nets up relatively cheaply. I think this one was about twenty pounds. Um, so it's quite a good idea just to have a bit of um, a bit of a look around, um, a bit of a sweep up, and um, you can just get a general sense and feeling of what what beneficial insects you've got. So with a sweep net, for example, just sweep it up and down your field margin and into your crop, tip it into a white tray, and then you'll just be able to identify the key ones. Obviously, there's, um, there's an option to get that, those, um, some of that monitoring done independently as well. So yeah, as I say, establishing a base of what your baseline populations are is, um, is a really good idea. And then, as I said, regarding the pitfall traps as well, it's just getting an idea of what distance your uh, beneficial insects are able to travel across the crop. Um, and always ensuring they've got feed and a habitat resource, particularly for overwintering. So you want to keep them as close to your crop as possible by supplying them with all, with all the beneficial things they need to survive over winter. So in the bottom left here, there's a picture of a um, pollen and nectar flowering margin. That picture is obviously taken in the spring, but through the winter, it does provide a good food source and habitat for them, um, which would be close to a to um, bordering on a on a veg crop, um, and then we can here we can just see um, some the effect of some par of parasitic wasps on aphids here. Um, we can see one um, just in the middle there, one parasitized aphid, and then I think there's two or maybe three active aphids in that plant. So we on the on the back of that leaf. So we can really have a think about: Are we seeing enough effect from the from the natural predators um, that are in that are in um, that are already in the crop, or do we need to consider potentially introducing some more? Another thing to bear in mind, and there's just a graph on the right here, is to look at: We always know that our pest numbers will increase much quicker than our predator numbers will. So it's all about trying to minimise that lag time at the top. So what's What's, how can we shorten the lag time between peak pest numbers and peak predator numbers? So any of these things is regarding making sure we've got an overwintered source for beneficial insects. Can we implement strips in between in larger fields to give them a bit of a network of places to feed and shelter um, would be good. And also, can we shorten the lag time by applying some biological products as well? And then we've got chemical control. It's, um, I'm not going to major on this just because there's a, within, um, within horticulture, we've got a huge level of diversity of crops and crop approvals as well. So we could be here all night discussing what's approved and what isn't approved within certain horticultural crops. But basically, 
as far as chemical plant protection products go, we're um, losing them. We're losing quite a lot of them within the conventional growing sector quite quickly. So a big one um, last year was thiocloprid. So products such as Biscaya and Calypso had a use up period uh, which finished in 2021. So we guess, as I say, conventional chemistry is getting fewer and far between, particularly within the horticultural sector. The number of actives being approved for minor crops is significantly less. If we take AFOX, for example, which is a widely used, um, which was a widely used um, aphicide, um, it's, it is still approved, but it's approved on much fewer crops now. So we've seen that lost on a lot of the field scale veg crops. And, um, but we are seeing different actives such as flipper and bativier, but they are, as I say, they're all life cycle disruptors. There's no, or there's very limited locked, uh, knockdown capability on these of these products. So we need to be applying them much earlier and in a much cleverer way. And with it, it's much more of an in, using them in an integrated approach. And we see big resist, you know, we're seeing big resistance buildups with things like pyrethroids and aphids. So, you know, that's also something to bear in mind when we're looking at more chemical or conventional um, control methods. The trials and tribulations of trial to, trying to implement an IPM uh, strategy is, um, you know, it's really important to start at the beginning. So when you're looking at your overall farm plan or your overall cropping plan, we need to really think about, um, as I say, rotation starting at the beginning and then look at where your field plan and then your individual field plans are as well. So have we got habitats to in, encourage beneficial insects um, and such like. And then we also need to think about customer specification. When do predatory insects become a pest? This is a topic that we talk about a lot within, um, that I talk about a lot with growers and licensees is that on the, uh, for this right hand picture there we can see we've had really good um, control from a with aphid from hoverfly on that picture so all those pale areas where we've got was where we've got clusters of um, mealy cabbage aphid and they've now been eaten by hoverfly but the issue we get with that is that the hoverfly then appear in higher numbers once they've eaten all the aphids they then the larvae then get laid and crawl up into the heads of broccoli these aren't noticeable at point of harvest or at point of packing in many cases. It then gets wrapped and chilled, which then with the chilling, it then drives the um, larvae further up into the head, which we can't, we can see them eat. It's even less likely we'll see them. And then they don't come out until they start to warm up in the on the retailer's shelf or in somebody else, or in somebody's shopping bag. So that again, that can cause us significant quality issues and complaints. So it's how we manage that. It's how we manage that. Um, we need to monitor closely those um, pred those predatory species and what effect they're having on crop quality. But then also we need to manage that relationship with customers and consumers as well. And then it's just managing all the tools in the toolbox. So it's not a one size fits all. Every season is different. So we do, we've got multiple things that we need to be juggling all at the same time. And it is complex. Yeah, you know, what, what fitted as last season isn't necessarily going to work for us this season, or we're going to use more of one and less of the other. So it's just a, it is a complex juggling act. And the key is we need to be proactive. So that brings us back to our regular monitoring and all the different monitoring uh, practices we have. So whether that's field, um, as walking the fields, whether that's being able to set traps and access them remotely to get a much broader picture, or whether it's using some of the additional re uh, resources we've talked about. And then I'm just gonna touch very briefly on um, at DEFRA, SFI and ELMS. Um, and when we look at what potential options are available to us, it's really good to think about how those options can help us deliver an IPM strategy and what the financial benefit of those is. And I will, you know, I'll take this opportunity just to ask you that, you, you know, from a horticultural point of view, it is a bit of a struggle at the moment um, to get some really great, um, you know, and we're, we're working really hard within the sector to get 
some really good options for horticultural growers, particularly those working on um, rented land and uh, working in a much, you know, in a mixed rotation with different land managers. So if, there, if you do get an opportunity to get involved or ask any questions um, with DEFRA, the SFI and the ELMS team, or get involved in any of the projects that are out there, then um, please do, because um, it's something that we're trying to push up the agenda for the horticultural sector, um, probably more than it has been uh, done previously. And then um, there's just some additional resources there. So I'm sure Steph will make some of these links available. We can put them in the chat. Um, so there's just uh, some of the um, wider net, uh, networks of monitoring and forecasting. Um, there's some really good resources out there as well to help with your field monitoring as well. I'd recommend you get um, this book here from the AHDB, which is the Pest and Natural Enemies Encyclopedia. That's really useful. And um, again, Innovative Farmers have got some really good um, field labs on their current and ones that have been finished, um, which center on um, integrated crop management. And also look at the SEPTA Plus um, link with them from the a on the AHDB website. That's a really big project that the AHD have been working hard, hard on in the last four years, which is centered on um, reducing the adverse environmental, environmental impacts of plant protection products and looking at new biological and integrated um, control controls across the whole of horticulture. So there's lots of different things, whether that be within field veg, fruit, ornamentals. Um, so it's massive. So it's, that's a really, you know, that's a really good resource to look at. Um, if any of you are basis registered, there's some really good webinars on the um, and workshops on the basis classroom portal. Um, and if you've got any other further questions, then there's my contact details there. Um, so you can contact me through email or on Twitter. And that's it. Brilliant, thanks so much, Carolyn. Really clear, um, covered a lot of ground there, really, really useful stuff. Um, and uh, Carolyn obviously talking um, a lot about kind of commercial large-scale um, horticulture there. Um, and so what we wanted to provide with this uh, webinar was um, perspective of the large scale stuff and then also perspective of the smaller um, scale horticulture but actually the, there will be and there is a huge amount of overlap in the different types of techniques um, so yes thank you Carolyn if anyone has any questions remember to put them in the chat um, and we will come to them at the end um, after the next presentation as well so um, next presentation um, is Pete and Dom who I believe that they are at the Botanical Gardens in Cambridge at the moment um, and are going to do a, a double act for their presentation. Um, so over to you Pete and Dom. Um, right, <laughs> hello thanks very much for coming everybody and thanks for the introduction um, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to share this, uh, share this talk. Um, I'm Peter Rapson, this is Dominic Walsh. Together we are the um, farm managers for Code Farm Community Farm in Cambridge. Um, for those of you that don't know, which is perhaps lots of people, um, we are um, Code Farm, if I can just move to sharing the screen. Um, can everyone see that okay? So this is, um, a kind of cornucopia of some of last year's vegetables. Can everyone see that? Um, we can. You might need to go on to um, the slideshow mode, but we can see. Uh, thank you very much. Well, we are we are gardeners rather than uh, <laughs> IT. <laughs> um, wait a minute. Um, where is it? There we go. Start. Right. Is that a little better? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. And here are the um, so here's some of our veg and the. Um, our partners in this uh, presentation. Um, so Co Farm is um, a community farm. It's the first one of its kind. And the idea is that it's a pilot project for um, other such farms within Cambridgeshire and wider in, you know, wide, more widely in the UK. Um, <clears throat> you can see here um, four main outcomes that we hope to deliver with what we are doing. So we are working, 
We are basically growing food organically um, with the help of um, um, people in the local community. So community volunteers help us grow the food. Um, the only people who have um, a horticultural background or at least um, a professional horticultural background tend to be Dom and I, and um, we uh, teach often complete novices how to grow fruit and veg. The food that we produce get, then gets um, put back into the community um, via community food hubs, because whilst Cambridge is a wealthy place, um, there's great disparity in terms of um, income and there's real food poverty here. So if you look at these four outcomes here, um, Co-farming is about creating a thriving ecosystem, which is what we're largely going to talk about this evening, and that is an agroecological approach to um, food growing. Um, um, so what we're doing is we are um, improving food security in the area, we're increasing biodiversity in the area, and we are um, strengthening community. So um, co-farming, people coming together to grow food, um, to grow food outside is good for physical and mental well-being and it's a social activity. It was absolutely um, essential and it's so helpful for people in the aftermath of the first lockdown. Um, uh, yeah, um, I'll just move on. We've got this site here on Coldham's Common in Cambridge. It's some private land which we rent. It's 2.8 hectares. It was um, farmed conventionally for um, several decades and then left fallow for five years so um, we had an awful lot of weeds to deal with on site um, initially so that's how it was just three years ago the site's very the project's still very much in its infancy we've just been the first plant went in the ground in june 2020 um, it the design for the farm, I'll just go back, oh, you can see that on the right hand side, this came about as a result of a public consultation over a kind of 18 month period where um, we invited people locally to talk about what they'd like to see in a community farm. So we've come up with this design, we've got the whole field to, to play with, in the middle is a two acre uh, market garden where we grow um, largely vegetables, to the north we have planted um, how many trees, Don? Well, 150 fruit trees altogether on nice. site. In, in the in the heritage uh, orchard, there's uh, 76 uh, at the moment. 76, 73 different varieties of East Anglian apples and plums and some pears because the ground is quite is, is not acidic enough for pears really. All the way around the central square, we've um, sown um, meadow plants. Sure. Um, and as more funding becomes available, it is because um, this is, I say, it's still very much in its infancy, uh, it's, the project's very much gathering momentum at the moment. We hope to, um, we, we, we hope to have a teaching apiary off to the left hand side of that. We will have a barn and where people can meet, we have events, courses, etc. <coughs> and we will um, have a cafe where we can actually make some of the food available to people um, for sale. Um, if I move on quickly, because I want to get to the actual- This was initially, the whole field was covered in rag boards. So we had to, <clears throat> it was actually uh, myself, Peter and Gavin, and one chap, one nice chap from the council who pulled all this stuff. We were suited up and we were wearing masks ahead of the pandemic. It was quite fashionable, obviously. Uh, you could still taste the metallic taste in your mouth as you were pulling it up. The whole field was, was like this, basically, having been farmed uh, some eight years ago now. So glyphosate would have been used and there would have been, it, the, the ground was basically knackered, um, you know. Uh, there was very little nutrient levels, um, even though it had prior to prior to being farmed some, you know, years ago, it was a, a coprolite mined area. So it had a, a great phosphorus bank at one time, which was used for uh, agriculture elsewhere and for explosives. Um, yeah. Right, I'll carry on. So um, I'll just go very quickly through the setup and then we'll, we will like and we will return. We will look at the approaches that we have to um, for um, pest management um, without resorting to um, chemical controls. This was just, so we had the, plant, the field ploughed um, back in uh, June 2020 and put up our first of our physical controls, which is a fence to keep out muntjac deer, which are rife here, and also rabbits. So that's fence dug into the ground. First plants going in and lots of volunteers putting plants in and also weeding. 
Um, I'll just leave it on this one for the moment because you can see that amongst all the food, in fact you can't really see food here, all along the paths and all along the beds are um, in season huge numbers of flowers which we start from, um, start from seed ourselves. Um, so the idea, yeah, the idea is that by having an agroecological approach um, which is basically creating a very biodiverse and bio, <laughs> biodiverse area, um, we can basically um, in, entice in, attract lots of beneficial um, pre, um, predatory insects, predatory well, animals basically, whether that's insects, um, birds, mammals, whatever, we'll, we'll go into this in more detail later. But um, everything we're doing, we're doing, we're growing organically, so we are not using chemical herbicides or pesticides, um, and we're finding that because we have this great resource, which is an awful lot of volunteers, so far we've had five 500 through 500 in the last volunteers. two and a half years and that's eight eight thousand five hundred hours yeah from uh, volunteer time because we have this great reservoir of people we can actually achieve an awful lot um just by sort of person power um we have you know our ground isn't compacted we don't run heavy machinery over it all the time we really can just get people under netting picking off pests and checking, inspecting things for pests and diseases. So we're finding at this, on this scale that using things such as biological controls, physical controls like barriers, it's all really doable. Um, and we, in, in, in the last, well, in the last two seasons, we just started the third season and the first season we started very late in June. We've already, in the first season, we produced four tons of organically grown food with an incredibly low carbon footprint, just going immediately out into the local area. Um, and last year, 12, um, eight tons. So uh, Well, up, up to this point, about <coughs> 20 tons of food in, to the food Up to this office. point, it's yeah. about 20 tons. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, I'm just going to pass you on to Dom now to talk about um, how we go about, well, more about the agroecological well, well, we kind of, uh, everything starts with the soil. So <clears throat> first of all, we, we uh, entered the field and the soil was very poor. So we had to think about how we could enhance it and how we could uh, make it make it productive. Uh, so we ha we basically added tons and tons of uh, organic matter, um, uh, most of which initially came from uh, as PAS one hundred from Amy Sesper, uh, so who kindly donated it to us. So we had thirty two tons in our first season, and then another thirty two tons in our second season. But we have started uh, to uh, we have started composting systems where we're using. Uh, Compost accelerators, organic compost accelerators. Uh, we're using uh, introduction of mycelium, and we're going to be int introducing biochar into the system so that anything that's waste on the site, if it can't be composted, then it's going to be made into biochar. Uh, and biochar, a centimeter cube of biochar has the has the surface area of, of two tennis courts, which you can all have microbial activity. Uh, biochar draws in nutrients, so if you were to use it straight on the soil, you'd be depleting your plants. Uh, but to use it into a compost system, you're actually creating something of a super compost, which then can go back and release the nutrients back into the soil where it's much, much slower. Um, uh, we've been using cover crops uh, <coughs> uh, to uh, vetches. We've been using Vicky Filosa and uh, Vicky Sativa, so uh, Perry vetch and common vetch to increase the nitrogen levels and also using uh, Persian clover. Uh, and <clears throat> plowing this back in or taking off a certain amount of it, then plowing it back in. Uh, we all, we've also been using buckwheat to uh, draw up the phosphorus. Uh, this has been, a, 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 we found it to be very useful against Sozomyvensae, so against creeping thistle. We had vast areas of creeping thistle, and <clears throat> where we pulled it and pulled it and pulled it, it still comes back because its root system goes down to sort of about half a metre, which you'll never dig out. Um, and then goes along and then comes up and goes along. Um, and so what we found was the use of buckwheat to, uh, as a cover crop where the worst areas of the creeping thistle were, drew the phosphorus away from the roots of the, of the uh, uh, creeping thistle, therefore not allowing it to proliferate as much. And so we've actually conquered it quite well in many parts of the field. Um, 
this was particularly in the in the uh, meadow areas where we weren't disrupting it so much, which has an impact on the growing areas because then obviously the seed will blow back in if it's still growing and still proliferating. Um, we're using wood chips, we're using straw mulch to improve the soil as well and green manures. For cilia we use quite a lot in order to, um, in order for the pollinators and then plowing it back in to, to uh, increase the uh, the organic content of the soil. We, as, as Pete said, we're using no uh, chemicals at all. So that allows the soil organisms to proliferate. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we're also inoculating uh, all of our perennial plants with mycorrhizal, uh, not feeding them because the plant becomes, the plant uh, won't establish the relationship with, with the uh, fungi and therefore be more resilient, have more drought resistance and be able to take up more nutrients <clears throat> if it has available plant food. So uh, the, all of the 150 fruit trees and all of the 1800 hedge trees, we planted mixed hedging uh, around the market garden two acre area and also in other areas around the site. None of them have been fed None of them have been watered. They have been mycorrhizal dipped and then planted and left to their own devices and they're all growing healthily. Um, with, the, with the annuals, in other words, vegetables, and with the annual flowers, we tend to put those in with a bit of feed. And then we'll use some organic seaweed as well on top of that. Um, Pete, over to you for um, the next bit. Well, I'll say, um, the kind of habitat, by the oh, no, habitat we're trying to create to bring in uh, beneficial creatures, that's pollinators or predators. Um, we've got um, a very sort of wild fruit rich hedge all the way around the site. So we've um, got a lot of crab apples. So, so crab apples is so pollination so partners for our fruit trees. And, um, and we've got hawthorn, we've got blackthorn, we've got uh, the meadow areas around. We over sowed it because we've got a real pigeon problem, so we had to over sow it. We sowed uh, 17 different types of meadow grass, we sowed uh, for about 40 different types of wildflower species, uh, which obviously bring in all the hoverflies, which uh, there's about 240 species of hoverflies in this country, over half of which predate, um, predate aphids and white fly and black fly and all these different pests that we do have. Um, but some of the things we plant bring in um, beneficial birds, which pick off aphids absolutely. or pick off slugs. Um, we have small ponds, which um, very quickly have frogs, toads and newts in them. And obviously that's a good um, thing for... And we um, have frogs born in them now. Yes, we? already. already um, we can't feed now. birds directly. I mean, they eat buckwheat, they um, eat cornflowers, they eat sunflowers. We can't feed them directly because otherwise we'll have problems with rats. But nonetheless, we've, you know, the actual number of bird species we're seeing. We've had about 60 species through the site in the last year mm -hmm. and a half um, that we've noticed. So it is becoming a very rich area, much, much more biodiverse than Absolutely. before. And I mean, um, we've, the perennials we're planting, we're creating climes in all, in all of those areas of shelter for different things. So, uh, you know, uh, such things as uh, Chrysopa can, Chrysoperla can overwinter, so the green lacemings can overwinter, so we have areas for that, as well as making lacemings boxes and the like. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the ponds also have the benefit of, uh, the ponds that we have on site also have the benefit of uh, holding the temperature stable, uh, so things don't get so hot, and also don't succumb to late frosts. Um. So we have quite a lot of, um, in terms of our approaches, we also have quite a lot of overlap with Carolyn um, and the things she's been talking about. So some of the cultural controls that we, um, that we use. So a lot can, we can go, on, particularly on the scale that we are working, a lot can be done with good plant husbandry. So um, we favour bringing in, uh, growing ourselves, but growing on, in polytunnels on site and also back at our respective houses, because it's quite a Heath Robinson affair, um, bringing in lots of well-grown, healthy little modules, well able to withstand a bit of pest attack, well able to compete with some of the weeds that's in this quite, we've got a big weed seed bank, as you can imagine. So we're bringing in modules, we're spacing them well, we, because uh, we have no shortage of people, we're getting um, them to, you know, it's brassicas, et cetera, and we've dead, diseased, um, um, dead and diseased leaves, et cetera. We are, practicing lots of weed control, so hoeing around of a lot of our stuff, because again, we've got no shortage of people. We're just doing everything we can to make healthy plants that can um, withstand some um, dis uh, 
attacked by pests and disease. We mulch where we can to conserve the water and reduce stress. Um, so that's to do with husbandry. We also, we also use predator banks. <clears throat> so <clears throat> any wood that we're cutting on site, uh, we will uh, drill holes in it and create predator, predator banks within the market garden area. So the predators can go then go out into the crops and get our pests. Um, um, so we, we employ physical controls, so barriers like Carolyn was talking about, so we've got the fencing to keep rabbits and deer out, we use um, butterfly netting um, on our brassicas, um, so that whole flies can still get in and eat um, such as the white fly, um, but the cabbage white butterflies can't get in. But then sometimes you get rips in the net, um, but then we have enough people that we can go in and we can check things and actually squash caterpillars if we need to, because it's, it's, um, it's a large site, but it's not, it's not field scale. Um, we use um, mesh, as previous, as Carolyn talked about, we use that against um, carrot fly and the allium leaf miner fly. Um, that's expensive. Um, so we're hoping as time goes by, we can get more of the narrow gauge stuff so we can grow more salads in spring because Cambridge gets very dry springs. And so leaf, flea, um, leaf beetle is a, um, is a problem. Um, we have other barriers such as biodegradable rabbit guards all the way around all the trees that we've planted. Um, we do um, other cultural controls such as choosing resistant cultivars. I think um, carrot varieties such as resist the fly or fly away. Um, and again, with, and rotation again is important because um, if we don't move crops around, as you know, as everyone knows, then there's a buildup of crop specific um, pests and diseases in the soil. So it's important to keep moving things around like that. Um, we also employ biological controls, but then Dom's going to talk about that. Yeah, we, we um, <clears throat> over the last two years, we've introduced uh, uh, lace wings. Uh, we've introduced uh, the green lace wing, which is the only lace wing that overwinters. And that's under the netting? Uh, we put it under the netting. We actually put it under the butterfly netting. Uh, so they are actually in there. And then we also uh, put in lace wing boxes under the netting with uh, male lace wing pheromone blocks. So uh, the females can then uh, can then hibernate in the lacing boxes, which are filled with straw. Um, this, the advantage of this is the, uh, the cabbage white fly uh, also hibernates and goes into an ovarian diapause. It actually doesn't, it doesn't completely shut down its ovaries. They, they go down to a very slow pace. So when it warms up, they can, they can uh, then breed almost immediately. Uh, so if we have the lacing uh, hibernating there, then they are ready to, to take on, take on the uh, white fly and start to predate those. Uh, you do have to be careful with the, uh, with the lace wing larvae because if you don't deploy them very quickly, they will eat each other. They're incredibly voracious. The, the, uh, the larvae are called aphid lions and they will eat almost anything. They're very, very small. Uh, we also deploy uh, two spot ladybirds. So we buy these, buy these controls in, uh, which are available and deploy them as soon as we get them really. Uh, we we um, have also been looking at using Incarsia formosa uh, in the polytunnels and Phytocelus uh, predatory mites. These are very different, you know, diff uh, Phytocelus are- uh, Against red spider mites. Against red, red spider mites. Um, uh, the trouble you have with some of these uh, uh, insects uh, biological controls is that if they don't have enough prey then they'll start going for your crops and that's that's the case with the predatory mites. Uh, we are also looking at the possibility of using Bacillus thuringiensis. It's used very effectively on box tree moth and on cabbage white as well. Different, uh, different variety of thuringiensis. Uh, so if we do have a serious problem then we'll be looking at looking at spraying, spraying the plants with uh, bacteria which uh, disrupts their guts basically. And so they die within a couple of days. Um, we are getting, we have noticed on uh, uh, cavalo plants that uh, we get quite a lot of uh, parasitic wasp cocoons. So they are prevalent and we get our volunteers to make sure they're not pick picking off these leaves. And so we keep those parasitic wasps in their crops. And again, the whole thing is that we are working on, although it's like a, 
massive allotment site. We're working on a scale with lots of, with you know, perhaps 20 volunteers on a, on, a, on a nice sunny Sunday. We've actually got enough people that we can be checking things, inspecting things by hand and dealing with it that way. Um, it's a, really it's all about trying to trying to create a habitat where these things will come in anyway. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and you, have, wasps, you know, you have, a, you have a balanced ecosystem which is effectively dealing with the problems. Um, so I think to sort of wind this wind this up, let's just have a look at some of the um, some more of the slides. Um, we're just going to towards and just talk about our, a few specific pests we have, um, pests that we have, and how we deal with them. So. Carrot fly, we found that um, mesh works very effectively. Um, um, a new thing for us has been the allium leaf miner fly. Um, two years ago, our first ever crop of leaves, I would say that about 80% of them um, had damage. And we want to encourage people locally to, um, to be eating really healthy pesticide free food. And so we don't want to be giving them stuff that's damaged. We, we so, are lucky enough though that the, the uh, Cambridge Sustainable Food was still willing to take uh, the damaged the, stuff, the damaged stuff because yeah. they'll make it up into meals for people. So rather than it going as a as a, you know, a vegetable product to a, to an individual, uh, it can be sorted out by a chef yes, and, so. and go and still be value added. We, but then we found in the last season by keep, keeping the um, the leaks in particular covered with. Um, mesh at the two important times of the, uh, the fly's life cycle, which is uh, March and April, and then September through November, we found that I would say only 5% were damaged this year. So that was really, really heartening and um, something you know, we'll be covering the garlic and, and the leeks again this year. Um, we do have a problem with mice, um, so we, we, don't feed the, um, we don't feed the birds, so we don't have mice and rats eating. Um, eating the food. The problem we have with mice is that they we can't direct so broad beans or peas. We have to bring them in modules or drain pipes full of pea seedlings, etc. Um, pigeons are a big problem, um, but we have to just cover brassicas with netting, um, young charred plants with netting. We do have a fox. Plants. We have a fox who we encourage who does kill pigeons, um, and we have and we're lucky enough to have uh, quite a lot of dog walkers. So it's a seven acre site. So the dog walkers going around the field will deter the pigeons. So it's all a, a sort of big interaction because we're in quite an urban environment. We do get quite a lot of people around. So it does help. And slugs, slugs, snails, these sort of things, we haven't encountered too much of a problem, but we keep things hoed, we keep things tidy, don't we? Yeah. Um, and, and we encourage we, amphibians. We, yeah, and I mean, and uh, birds. we, we would use nematodes, uh, you know, because they do work, uh, but you do have to often keep um, keep applying these things. Similarly, uh, we're looking into the use of uh, companion planting. So uh, as yet, we can't say firmly, yes, this does work, yes, this, no, this doesn't work, uh, but such things as uh, chives for carrot fly, different forms of alliums are very good and using things like feverfew, which is a, a tanacetum parthenium, uh, which gives off pyrethrum like the tanacetum coccinea does, the African painted daisy, which is a pyrethrum daisy. Um, and rather than use pyrethrum in the environment, which isn't very persistent at all, we're actually planting within the brassicas to stop such things as cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, it's something we're going to be trying. Also, the carrot fly, it's about teaching our volunteers good horticultural practice. So if you're thinking about carrots, um, not only making sure they're covered, but teaching people how to sow something thinly enough that it reduces the need for thinning later. And when they're harvesting, to make sure that they don't just pull up armfuls of stuff, bruise the foliation, entice carrot fly in. Um, all those sort of little tips. Um, let's just move towards the end of our slides now. So. Um, it just, um, it's, it's well worth visiting any time of year, but particularly in the summer, because the whole thing is just buzzing with, buzzing with insects. Huge numbers of volunteers. And as you can see, in amongst all the vegetables, that's ooh, yeah. small. Some and we get career there. changes. This, this uh, young woman is, is now working at one of the colleges in Cambridge. That's card enough. So netting in the, the top right photo, you can see brassicas under netting there. Um, and this is giving instruction to kids and one of the ponds in the foreground. Um, 
Yeah, we're, we're of, siding. Yeah, just yeah. keep on top of the weeds by siding. A lot of times, so they don't get a seed. Uh, we have a lot of bristly ox tongue and soncus, which we which we have to deal with, and we can't deal with it any other way except keep keep cutting it back, weakening it, and using cover crops to outcompete these things. Yeah, and it's going to take a little longer than it would be to set up a meadow from scratch, but it's working. And again, there's no shortage people are happy to do a day's scything because a lot of people have very sedentary jobs working from home etc um that's putting in um putting in the, putting in some deer fencing and then putting in uh one of our hedges which is again a predator bank you know, and used use pollinating partners and for bird food and for insect food um, and there's an overview of the site um two-thirds of which the right hand two-thirds of which we did, um, were in full production last year and we hope to do the full two acres this season um, and just well that's not the that's not the, the the whole of the harvest for July 2020 but that was just a small proportion of what comes off and you can see it's um, getting even more diverse as time goes by um, and I hope that gives you a bit of a flavor about what co-farm is about um, thanks very much to our yeah cheers um, sponsors and our um colleagues in yes yeah, thanks for your time again thanks very much both of you that was brilliant um yeah really clear really well done really passionate presentation there um so thank you to all of our speakers we have um about 10 minutes left if anyone has any questions so i'll just if you'd like to either put something in the chat or if you prefer to um unmute yourself and ask a question that's fine too just give people a minute, otherwise I might ask a question. <laughs> you could stop, sh stop sharing, um, Peter, then I'll be able to see people's faces. That'd be great, thank you. Thanks very much. So I think we have a question from Sarah. Hi, yes. Um, to both, uh, all speakers, were really well done this evening. Thank you very much indeed. Um, some really interesting facts and information. Um, my question is um, to Carolyn. Um, you mentioned overwinter for beneficials and the pollen and nectar mix. What would be your ideal targeted um, overwintering species prescription, what would you advocate for brassicas specifically? Because I'm fully aware that pollen and nectar mix isn't necessarily compatible to keeping the baddies out and the goodies in. No, thanks, Sarah. Um, that is a really good question. And it is a, I find it a complete minefield out there sometimes when looking at species mix. Um, it really depends on, I think, looking at soil type. Um, and I would say, you know, there's pollen and nectar. I, I use pollen and nectar as an example, but there's various overwintered um, bird covers and things that would potentially use the, um, perform the same purpose. Um, so I don't have a prescription I could give you. I think the best thing um, that I found um, the best thing I found is really just to talk to um, people, you know, whether that be Kings or Cotswold Seeds um, or any of these companies that are that are deliver, you know, that are supplying the seed and to talk about what um, really what you're looking for. It really depends on how how long you want those strips in for as well and what your potential management practices would be. Um, that's as I say, I haven't really got a prescription um, for you, which I realise probably isn't that helpful. Um, but that's really what I would suggest is um, we as, I'd sort of assess it on a farm by farm basis um, and look at, um, um, as I say, yeah, speak to these guys that, are, that have the various species mix. And if there's anything particular that you're looking for that's going to suit your soil type, um, the proportion within the mixes have the ability to be changed as well. So there may be certain plants within, um, within these mixes that won't suit your soil type, and there'll be others that will be more, uh, more prevalent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for your question, Sarah. Any other questions from anybody?
got a question for Peter and Dominic, if that's OK. So um, something that Carolyn mentioned earlier um, on about um, what customers want with their vegetables and, and um, the problem with finding you know, bugs, for want of a better word, in their in their vegetables and how to communicate that and what people expect of their vegetables. Um, and obviously, one, you know, one, one thing we probably need to do is is you know educate people about what those bugs actually are um, and not expect everything to look perfect and I just wondered whether in your um, experience giving organic food directly to people in the community whether you'd come across you know having to have any of these conversations with people whether you have any ideas about how we might com you know communicate to consumers about the benefits of finding bugs in their lettuce and what that means. <laughs> well it's the people at the food, the, the volunteers who run the food hubs are actually at the direct um, direct interface with the with the with the um, the, the food bank users, the food hub users. Um, so it's actually they do, <laughs> they're the people actually that are having to explain. But we actually find that we wash stuff ourselves, so we try and reduce the mm. amount. We inspect it. Yeah, we, we have a look through, we get rid of, we, we teach the volunteers what is an acceptable amount of um, of holes in things, what's an acceptable amount of um, white fly, etc. And we try and clean it up as much as we can. I know that at the food hubs, they, they do give it a wash, so it's not too bad. But the people, I think it's a sort of slow, um, it's a sort of slow process because um, although they might not be getting lots of pests on, they're getting stuff that's a bit wonkier, stuff that's not quite as um, uniform. Yeah, and so they get also also not necessarily massively headed up if they're not if they're planted by a volunteer who doesn't quite know what they're doing. Um, so they're learning about the actually the diversity of produce and that all of these things are still edible. The people that we directly affect um, are the all the volunteers that um, work with us. So um, we're also obviously um, consumers of, of fruit and vegetables. And because they're working closely with us and they're harvesting stuff, they very, um, we are showing them that it doesn't, although a lot of stuff does look like the stuff you get in the shops and is actually, and it's this kind of myth that if you grow things organically or grow things yourself, it's all gonna be lumpy and weird looking. That's not actually true. The majority of it actually looks great. But what you, what you can teach volunteers actually is that some of the stuff is a bit weirder but it's still edible or you can cut these bits and out they do have they, they or, do have the second sometimes yeah that's know, true which means that it is becoming more acceptable within society to take things which are a bit odder a bit imperfect you know, so they, they look and also one of the nice things is that in the shops for instance you don't get um less for instance um flowering cavalonero but those flowering shoots are lovely but you can actually with our volunteers we can teach them that actually you won't see that but that's also edible and if you grow something yourself you're incredibly proud of it you want to eat as much of it and waste as little of it as possible so we can very directly influence the 500 people that have been through the farm um, it's going to take a bit longer um, with outreach for the community but that said people are voting with their feet and very little of it's yeah. thrown away because <clears throat> a lot of the stuff is um, food, food hubs are very dry food and tin food heavy, so actually the, stu the stuff we put in goes like hotcakes. It goes like hotcakes and also we, we do like to do the unusual as well, so that then food becomes a talking point within the food hubs. And so where the things are more acceptable, so, you know, different coloured vegetables of different sorts, um, create that, that buzz. Okay. And I know that people in the hubs do warn that it might be the odd slug, but then they counter that by saying, but there's no chemical residue left on it. It's just, there's all, yeah. It's, uh, it's an educational process, isn't it? That's great. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a question in the chat from Martin. Um, so Carolyn, um, I guess at least initially, so is there any noticeable change in pest severity in response to extreme weather events from climate change? Um, and our high volumes of or prolonged rainfall exacerbating fungal disease. Um, and just on the um, extreme weather for sort of pest, yeah, we see where, where we've had really cold, you know, those um, cold winters, we do see some good wind, um, some good knockback, um, and the pest pressure is definitely slower to peak in the following season. Um, and I would say where we where we have heavier rainfall yes we are experiencing higher disease pressure but then that can quickly subside when we've got um 
you know, dry, much drier conditions as well. Um, we generally see, I think, um, the prolonged rainfall can cause us significant issues on the flowering brassicas as well, where we've got, um, we, we get heavy rainfall and things like pinhead rot or spear rot in broccoli, or where we've got um, lush frame and then we get moisture set, sitting on the heads, which can cause us, um, cause us issues. So yeah, I would say, you know, the and it's much more unpredictable as well. So what, you know, what I was saying earlier as regards um, you know, what what suited us last season, we know that's not ne not necessarily going to be the prescription for the coming season. So it is very changeable, and we're just having to manage it year on year and week on week in some cases. Thank you. And I get I guess um, something that climate change is probably bringing is a change in like new new pests and diseases, a change in which ones are prevalent in in you know in which year. Um, which I guess is another argument for trying to use a lot of, lot of cultural and biological controls because that is broader than a you know a pesticide that's targeting a very specific thing. Yeah, absolutely. I've had a query this week, uh, last week on blue oat mite, suspected blue oat mite, um, which is in protected cropping, but um, it's in a polytunnel. But again, that's not been seen for. You know, I think it's been seen twice by Ferrer in the last 35 years. So we're just trying to get um, a an, an identi a, you know, um, a certain identification done on that, so we can then sort of think about what can what um, cultural controls we can put in place. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's an ever changing picture, certainly. Great, thank you. Um, so um, we've come to the end of the time. Um, if you have any further questions, um, then um, do feel free to get in touch. Um, we'll follow up to everybody that signed up to the webinar with, um, with contact details um, and links to anything that was shared during the presentation as well. And this recording, um, if you missed anything um, or want to share it, will go up on the Agroecology website, as I mentioned. Um, so, yeah, thank you very, very much for Peter, Dominic and Carolyn for your brilliant presentations and thank you everybody for coming um, and hope you have a lovely rest of the evening. <laughs>